This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. A woman has just arrived at a shopping mall with her children. You will hear her talking to a man at the information desk. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6 and the floor plan of the shopping mall. Now listen and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I, I've never been here before and I've just got a few questions about where a few places are here. Fine. Here's a floor plan of the mall. You can take that with you. But if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to help. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I always find these floor plans a bit confusing. So could you just show me exactly where we are on this? No problem. Here we are at the information desk, right in the middle, next to the escalators. Right. Now, I heard there's a children's play centre where you can leave your children while you do the shopping. That's right. You can see it on the floor plan. It's in the corner, to the left of the supermarket. There are plenty of toys for them to play with there. Also, there's fresh fruit to eat and they can have fun with the other children. Sounds good, doesn't it, kids? I was thinking I might take them to have their hair cut first. Is that the hairdresser between the furniture shop and the children's clothes shop? Yes, it is. They do children's haircuts as well. Oh, lovely. Now, my little boy's going to a friend's birthday party next week and we wanted to buy a present. Do you know if there are any stores that might have things a seven-year-old boy would like? Oh, yes. There's a toy store right next to the shoe shop. They've got a good range of toys. I'm sure you'll find something for a child of that age. I often buy things there myself. The prices are quite reasonable. Oh, that's good to hear. Oh, and also, are there any toilets on this floor? Yes. They're in a bit of a hidden corner. You just go past the bookstore. You can see they sell newspapers there, too and down the corridor. Oh, yes, I see. I'd better take them there before we go to the hairdresser. Uh, what else do I need to do? Oh, yeah, I've got to buy some credit from a mobile phone. Can I do that at the phone kiosk over there near those benches? Yes, you can. You can also do it at the supermarket if you want. Right. Now, we've just come up from the car park, but we took the escalator. I might have a lot of things to carry later on, so I was wondering if there's an elevator. Yes, it's next to the computer store, near the top of the stairs. Oh, yes, I can see it now. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Oh, when I parked the car, I couldn't see how much you have to pay for parking. It's free for the first two hours, but after that it's $3 an hour. Hmm. 
Oh, well, I think with all the things we have to do, we might be here for more than two hours. So if you park there for three hours altogether, you have to pay $3. And if it's four hours, you pay $6 and, and so on. Yes, that's right. Uh-huh. How about the Children's Play Centre? Is there any charge for leaving your children there? Oh, no, that's a free service of the shopping mall. However, there's a policy that the children have to be at least 18 months old. Oh, my youngest is just 10 months old, but I'd rather keep her with me anyway. Also, we might need to get something to eat later. Is there any place to buy lunch? Oh, yes. You can get all kinds of things at the food court from snacks to fast food to healthy meals. There's a really good range. It's two floors up on level five. It's best to take the elevator. Do you know if they have pizza? <laughs> Both my kids really love pizza. Yes, they do. Oh, did you know you can watch a movie here too? Yes, I've heard there's a cinema on the top floor. There might be something on that my kids would be interested in. Yeah, there are a couple of children's films on at the moment. Well, thank you very much. You've been a great help. My pleasure. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2. You will hear a talk by a representative of an agency that finds people to look after homes when their owners are away. He is talking to a group of homeowners. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 20. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you've been able to make it to this introductory talk about our agency, which is called Contented Homes. My name's Gary, and I'm going to explain what our business involves. But first, I'd like to tell you something about the background of our agency. We commenced operations back in 1989. And essentially, our job is to find suitable people to live in and look after other people's homes while they're away. The homeowners, people like yourselves, might be away on holidays or temporarily working in another city or country. And they want to be sure that while they're away, their home will be secure and that when they come back, everything will be in good condition. When we first started out, we conducted most of our business over the phone, but now the bulk of it is done over the Internet. Basically, this is how it works. Homeowners come to us when they need to find reliable, trustworthy people to take good care of their home for a limited period of time. The people who stay in your home and take care of it are called house-sitters. The host sitters live at your place for periods of anything between one month and two years. There are all kinds of reasons why people host sit. Some are couples, others are single. Often they're saving up to buy their own home, or they may be renovating their own home and just need somewhere to stay temporarily, or they might have just moved to your city. Although house-sitters don't pay you any rent when they're living in your home, they are required to pay any bills for the telephone, gas, electricity, and so on. So for the homeowner, this is not a way to make money. 
When someone registers with us to become a host sitter, they provide us with some of their personal details, such as their age and occupation. I need to stress here that our agency does not carry out a security check on the people who have registered with us to be host sitters. Many host sitters have references from people whose houses or apartments they've looked after in the past. It's up to you to check those references. Allowing someone to live in your home is not a decision to be taken lightly. So we also recommend that you meet with any prospective host sitters and interview them before deciding which person or people would be most suitable to look after your home in your absence. There are similarities between host sitters and tenants, but there are differences as well. Host sitters don't have as many rights as people who have a lease on a property. As the homeowner, you can give a spare set of keys to your home to a neighbor, friend, or relative. That person's allowed to drop in on the host sitters without prior notice at any time, within reason, to check that the house is in order and the host sitters aren't allowed to stop them from entering. There are many good reasons to use the services of a house sitter. Burglars soon notice when people are away, so theft is much less likely if someone is living in your home. But it's not simply a matter of security. Host sitters keep your home clean and tidy. Some of them are even more house pro than the actual owners. In addition, many people need a house sitter to look after pets and keep the garden in order. Now, I'd like to tell you about the fees we charge. First, you, the homeowners, don't have to pay us anything. When people who want to be host sitters come to us, they have to pay $375 to go into our directory. That's where we get the money to run our service. As I said, we don't check to see that the information supplied by them is correct. It would simply cost us far too much time and money to do that. When you've decided that you want to go ahead and have a host sitter look after your home, we definitely think it's a good idea for you to take out insurance for your home. You'll find that many insurance companies prefer the higher degree of security if someone's living in your home than if it's left empty. Anyway, I hope I've given you a clear idea of our service. And now, I'd be happy to take any questions. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two students talking to their teacher about a seminar paper they are preparing for their population studies class. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. So, how's your seminar paper going? Oh, it's almost ready. My head's just full of statistics at the moment. <laughs> Is there anything you found particularly interesting? Yeah. For instance, about where people choose to live when they migrate to Australia. The focus of our talk is on migration to Sydney, but we found we needed to look briefly at migration to other parts of Australia as well. Hmm. Most migrants go to the big cities, but it isn't the same for all nationalities. 
For instance, over the last five years with the British, only about one third of them altogether went to Sydney and Melbourne. So where did most of them go? Oh, all over the place. But for some reason, quite a few ended up over in Perth. Now, that's not a bad place to live. No, but with the Chinese, 26% of them choose to live in Melbourne and 58% in Sydney. Really? Do you have any idea why the Chinese and British have such different settlement patterns? Well, not really. Sometimes it's hard to find out exactly why people choose to live where they do. There's a thriving Lebanese community in Melbourne, but more than 7 out of 10 people from Lebanon were drawn to Sydney. I see. So you've covered groups from Europe, East Asia and the Middle East. Do you have anything on people from other regions? Yes. When we went through data from the Department of Immigration and the Bureau of Statistics, we found that in the case of the Malaysians, for some reason only a minority chose Sydney and Melbourne, but I don't know exactly where most of them ended up. I think quite a few of them were attracted to Queensland because of the climate. Yeah, it must be hard for people coming from a tropical region to get used to colder winters. What about the New Zealanders? Well, they don't need a visa for Australia, so they're counted separately from all other nationalities. But the vast bulk of them have ended up in Sydney. You'd think that Melbourne would be more to their liking because its climate's more like what they're used to, and the distance from New Zealand to Melbourne is about the same. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. You also looked into why people choose the places they do, didn't you? Yes. Well, people often go where the work is. I mean, it's no use finding a nice place to live if you're going to be unemployed. But there's a more decisive factor, and that is that people generally like to live near their friends and relatives and with people from their own country so they won't be so isolated. And they do that despite the higher housing prices in the larger cities. Yeah, rents are getting ridiculous. But hasn't Sydney always attracted people? I mean, even people born elsewhere in Australia? Well, historically that was the case. But even though Sydney's grown a lot recently, there's been hardly any increase in the number of Australian-born people living in Sydney. Hmm. Why is that? I mean, I can understand why people would be leaving. A lot of people feel Sydney's getting too crowded and hectic. But that can't be the reason, because they often end up in places such as southeast Queensland, where the infrastructure simply isn't coping with the rapid population growth and faster pace of life. The research shows that the ones leaving Sydney are particularly middle-aged and elderly people who own the place they live in. By selling their Sydney home when they retire and buying and living in a cheaper one elsewhere, they then have more funds left over. It must be difficult making that shift at their age. I think moving or migrating is hard for anyone. Quite right. But what effect is migration having? Well, there are all kinds of effects. But sociologists talk about a growing gap between Sydney and Melbourne on the one hand and the rest of the country on the other. You see, the most recent data shows that 60% of the overseas arrivals went to those two cities, even though Sydney and Melbourne combined have got just 40% of the country's population. But you've got to remember that Australia is one of the most urbanised countries in the world. A good 50% of the population live in the state capitals, not including the urban fringes. Is anything being done to promote growth in other regions? Well, the government's got several proposals. We need more people in rural areas, but no one's suggesting that we encourage farmers to migrate to Australia because agriculture is very capital intensive in this country. 
But the government's thinking about having lower tax rates on private firms that employ newly arrived migrants in towns outside Sydney and Melbourne. Of course, these days the government doesn't want to actually provide jobs for them, but they are willing to favour employers who employ them. Do you think that'd work? I don't know. There's nothing to stop them moving to one of the two big cities if they feel like it. Exactly. In fact, the statistics don't give the full picture. When they migrate, people very often initially live outside of Sydney. So in the statistics, they're recorded as having settled outside Sydney. But then after a while, many make the move to Sydney. So the real picture is even more out of balance than what the statistics say. Statistics really can be a slippery thing sometimes, can't they? <laughs> That's for sure. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Part 4. Emma Bell is an agricultural scientist. In the following lecture, she describes some of the advantages of the hemp plant. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. When we think of progress, we tend to look to the future. However, the past can also provide inspiration. Today, I'd like to outline some of the many ways in which the hemp plant, a plant that was used very widely until the early 20th century, can benefit both humans and the environment. You may remember that when the use of computers became more widespread, there was much talk of the paperless office. Yet now, far more paper is being used than ever before. Most of that paper is made from wood, but it can also be made from hemp. Hemp is a fast-growing annual plant that can be harvested within four months of germination, whereas a tree takes 20 years. This means that a hectare of hemp can produce 80 times as much paper as a hectare of trees. In fact, hemp was the main source for paper production until the 20th century, and the paper it makes is of superior quality to that made from wood. Many of the rivers in the vicinity of today's paper mills suffer the effects of pollution from bleach and other chemicals used in the manufacture of paper from wood. In contrast, paper made from hemp does not require bleach. So much clothing these days is made from cotton, yet fabric has been made from hemp for over 7,000 years. The trouble with cotton crops is that they take a heavy toll on the environment and are often dependent on irrigation. Hemp can grow using far less water and does not need as much fertiliser or pesticides. In fact, hemp crops even have a natural resistance to pests. Clothes made from the tough fibre of hemp also last longer than those made from cotton, which is not something that will make clothing manufacturers very happy. But another way in which hemp is the superior material is that it's more effective in blocking out UV rays from the sun, which can cause skin cancer. To top it off, Clothing made from hemp is very comfortable to wear. In parts of the world that still don't have electricity, this versatile plant can also be used to light lamps. Back in the days of sailing ships, 
when hemp was used to make ropes and sails, lamps were often fuelled by whale oil, which gave off a much stronger smelling black smoke. The pursuit of that oil was one of the reasons for the existence of the whaling industry, which hunted many species of whale almost to extinction. Closer to our own time, Henry Ford used hemp in the production of his first cars. These days, with panels being made of metal, even a minor accident can lead to costly repairs. Being derived from a plant, hemp panels would be less expensive. Yet perhaps an even more significant consequence would be that instead of old cars being left to rust by the roadside, an abandoned car made from hemp would rot faster. A further advantage in the case of automobiles is the fuel. One of the major causes of global warming is the use of fossil fuels in cars and trucks. Methanol is an alternative to petrol and it can be extracted from hemp. This fuel is already used by racing cars and it doesn't produce as much air pollution, thus placing a smaller burden on the air we breathe. Hemp is also a source for a variety of foods. The oil that's obtained from the plant can be used to make cooking oil, butter, cheese and even ice cream. Flour derived from hemp has a greater protein content than normal wheat flour and its seeds contain all the amino acids, providing a form of protein that's more easily digested than that in soybeans. Carpets made from hemp are more durable than other carpets and are resistant to mildew, which grows in humid or damp conditions. It can also be used in the home to produce furnishings such as fibreboard, furniture and even plastics. Paints and varnish made from petrochemicals contain poisons, whereas this is not the case with those produced from hemp. Hemp plants are best grown close together and because they produce an abundance of leaves, the ground underneath the plants is shaded, which hinders the growth of weeds. So farmers don't have to spend money on potentially dangerous herbicides. It thrives in areas with low rainfall and may be useful in combating salinity because it doesn't need irrigation and its long taproot can reach underground nutrients and water. As a fast growing plant, it's an easily renewable, biodegradable and ecologically sustainable source of a vast range of products that are currently made from polluting resources, such as coals, gas and oil. This is quite plainly a case where we can make progress by learning from the past. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.